Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I'm Sam, and I've got quite a story to share about the events that unfolded on my lakeside property. After retiring from my job as an investment banker, I sought solace in the serene countryside. The house I fell in love with came complete with a private lake, a perfect getaway from the bustling city life. Little did I know that my peace would be disrupted by a troublesome family, whom I'll refer to as the Joneses. Living in solitude, I enjoyed hosting summer parties for my friends. I didn't expect to have any neighbors out here, but to my surprise, the Joneses appeared one day, having a barbecue on my lakeshore. Initially taken aback, I decided to be open-minded and allowed others to use the lake as long as they respected the property and kept it clean. Unfortunately, the Joneses showed no regard for the environment, often leaving behind a trail of trash, even polluting the lake itself. When I confronted them about it, they dismissed my concerns, claiming they had no responsibility since they didn't own the lake. It was clear they couldn't be reasoned with, and their continuous disregard frustrated me, tarnishing the peace I sought. One weekend, feeling overwhelmed, I decided to take a sudden trip back to Sarajevo, leaving behind the troubles that plagued my lakeside haven. However, a neighbor's text message disrupted my getaway, informing me of a massive party the Joneses planned on my property. I felt a mix of anger and determination to teach them a lesson they wouldn't forget. Returning to my lakeside retreat, I noticed the Joneses' car parked nearby. With a sly plan forming in my mind, I unpacked my things and made my way toward them. Engaging in a friendly conversation, I discreetly scouted for any signs of their upcoming party, but found nothing out of the ordinary. Perhaps they had tidied up this time to conceal their intentions. I decided not to confront them about the party, and instead expressed my desire to make the lake more accessible to the public, an idea they didn't seem too thrilled about. Nonetheless, I received a surprising thank you from the stern matriarch of the family, the wife. A few nights later, as I settled down to watch television, a forceful thud startled me. Investigating the noise, I discovered an invitation to the Joneses' party on the lake, dropped off through my letterbox. Glancing at the date, I couldn't help but smile. It was the perfect opportunity to execute my revenge. The following morning, I eagerly prepared for their arrival. My plan unfolded flawlessly. I sent a text to the Joneses, feigning sickness to dissuade them from attending. Outside, I laid out wooden planks and twigs, creating what appeared to be a parking area for their guests. However, beneath the surface, hidden boards filled with nails awaited their vehicle's arrival. As the day progressed, I observed the fleet of cars parking perfectly on the planks, oblivious to the impending danger. Not a single person seemed to notice the slow deflation of their tires as they carried kegs and crates to the picnic area. With the party winding down, I took action. Carrying a stack of homemade signs, I swiftly positioned them around the lake, ensuring they were in plain sight from the parking area. As an extra measure, I uncovered the nail boards, making it seem as though they had been there all along, a warning ignored upon their arrival. Retreating to my house, I observed the commotion unfold. A growing crowd of bewildered partygoers surrounded the newly erected, no trespassing signs, their confusion escalating. Panic spread through the air as they rushed to leave, only realizing their flat tires upon starting their vehicles. Chaos and bewilderment filled the aftermath of their ill-fated party. Moments later, Karen Smith, half in a state of panic and half seething with anger, pounded on my door. Accusing me of ruining their party, she demanded an explanation, firmly reminding her that she had trespassed on private land, using a private lake. I warned her that involving the authorities would be the consequence if they repeated their mistake. From that day forward, the Smiths never set foot on my property again, and peace finally returned to my lakeside retreat. The incident served as a reminder to all those who dared to trespass that the lake held its own secrets, capable of delivering swift and dramatic retribution. As for me, I reveled in the satisfaction of restoring the tranquility I sought when I first moved here. The next one is a pro-revenge story. This all happened around Christmas, New Year's, but I just found this sub and am obsessed with it now, so I have to share my story. My grandparents immigrated to Canada from Italy in the 70s and opened up a restaurant. When they passed away, the restaurant went to my parents. Over the decades, they grew and expanded it. I have been working at the restaurant since I was 15. Over time, my parents got older and eventually retired, becoming snowbirds, going to Florida for the winters. 
They left the restaurant to me a few years ago, but still retained a small percentage ownership as an additional revenue stream, along with their savings and annuities. As soon as I gained control, I pretty much modernized the old place. I remodeled the restaurant, changed the logo, reached out to local and national papers to put out ads, and invited food critics, bloggers, vloggers, etc. It was very slow at first, and I began to worry that the loan I took out to do all this was the biggest mistake I had ever made, and I had ruined three generations of my family's business. But eventually it began to work, and a local semi-famous YouTuber featured us in one of his videos, which was the catalyst for more people to come and review. Eventually, we were seeing 5x10x the business we usually got, even on a Monday. We became a hot spot for major events, and it wasn't uncommon for a celebrity to visit. On those nights, I even arranged for special high-profile chefs to visit and cook for our guests, which costs a fortune. So during the holidays, we were beyond packed. It got to the point where people would have had to make reservations in July to get a table in December. This process took years to get to where we are now. When it gets busy, I don't just sit in the back office. I'm on the floor doing whatever needs to be done, even if that means greeting people, bussing tables, or even mopping the floors. On other nights when we have high-profile guests or events, I'm in a blazer and am in charge, though. On one night, a group of six women walked in. Five of them looked like they were still in their early 20s, and the head of the group looked like she was in her mid-20s. My best theory was that she was one of the other four girls' older sister, or possibly an older sorority sister, to an incoming college freshman. I was greeting at the door as they were walking up. Queen Bee Karen was telling the baby Karens how this place is awesome, the food is amazing, and there might even be celebrities here. When she came up to me, she told me she needed a table for six. I replied, of course, can I please get the name on the reservation? She looked at me and said, oh, I didn't make one, but it's okay. The owner is a personal friend of mine. He said he always has one or two tables that he keeps open for special guests and said we can have one of those tonight. Now, generally, this is true of many high-profile restaurants, and lately, I have been doing that as well. But I had no clue who this woman was, and she definitely never spoke to me about any of this. I did get that she was trying to get in without a reservation, but she literally picked the worst person she could possibly talk to and try this. I told her, I am sorry, but we cannot seat anyone without a reservation. As you can see, we do not have any seats available. I didn't want to go all out and say, I'm the owner, and we have never spoken before, so I never promised you a thing, because I didn't want to embarrass her in front of the other girls she was with. At first! She then went on and said out loud to one of the other girls to take a picture of me. She will speak to the owner and make sure I'm either cleaning the toilet or fired by the end of the week. The other girls following her lead were like, yeah, kiss your minimum wage job goodbye. I'm not sure if they were in on it with her or if they honestly thought she knew the owner. Queen Bee Karen then went on and said, Look, you can just give us a table, or I can make life very difficult for you. This is not worth losing your job. Constantly pointing and trying to belittle me, saying things like, Obviously you aren't anyone here because if you were, you would know who I am and never even try to tell me anything other than yes or of course. Constantly trying to belittle me and get that table. At this point, it was a long day for me, and the way I saw it, I had three options. One, Tell her I'm the owner and just call her out on all of this. Two, just give her the table and let it be. Three, teach Queen Bee Karen and her little minions a lesson. I chose option three for various reasons, including some personality flaws I am aware that I have. But I like to think it was at least 50% really wanting to teach her a lesson. I smiled at her, said, Of course, ma'am, follow me, please. And I gave her one of the three tables we keep open in case a celebrity comes in, which happens from time to time. I told her I apologize for everything, and she is right. It would be simpler to just give her the table. I also told her that the first three rounds of drinks would be complimentary. I sat them down and personally served them. As they were sitting down, I told them we needed one of their credit cards and IDs just to keep on file, and we would give them back before they left. Queen Karen gave me her cards and told the baby Karen minions that tonight was on her. I took their orders, got them their free drinks, and told them that due to how busy we were that night, there might be a delay on the food. All the girls were only thinking about their free rounds. They ordered their three rounds and still no food. They eventually called me and asked me to check on it, the whole time giving me the world's nastiest attitude since even before they ordered. I told them I would check on it, but also asked if they would like any more drinks. 
They ordered two more rounds by the time the appetizers arrived. At this point, they were all drunk. They had done nothing but drink on an empty stomach most of the night, and only had salads after. As more food arrived, more drinks were ordered. What these girls never realized was that they were at our VIP table, which alone costs a few thousand just to sit in, but I didn't charge them for that. What I did charge them for was all the super expensive cocktails they had throughout the whole night, except for the first three rounds. In addition, the table they were sitting at, as mentioned, was VIP, so the menus were a bit different. For one, they didn't say prices on them, trade secret, and in addition they had certain higher-end menu options, such as white truffle, black caviar dishes, and specially imported West Coast oysters, among other things. At one point in the night, I was honestly rethinking what I was doing and thought I might be going too far with these poor girls. They might not know any better, but some things reassured me throughout the night, such as one of the baby Karens asking me if I felt like my life was worthless since all I ever became was a waiter. Also, one of my other employees told me how they were discussing how to duck with me to the point that they can just do this whenever they want, and I will always give them a table. I also overheard them say, he's cute, but I would never date a waiter like that, he is such a pushover. There were a bunch of comments like that the whole night, so I kept on with their life lesson. By the end of the night, each girl racked up a bill in the range of $500, $600 per girl. When I handed Queen Karen the bill of $4,232.23, with tax and tip included, of course, I had never seen anyone sober up so quickly. She went from laughing and giggling with her friends to nearly in tears. She called me over instantly and asked if this was some kind of joke. I took the bill, looked it over, and said, Oh yes, I apologize. I will get you the correct bill in a moment. Again, she felt a complete sense of relief, thinking she got someone else's bill, called me a duck idiot, and went on to talk to her friends. To be fair, I did make a mistake. I forgot to count her eighth order of a dozen oysters that costs about $120 per order, so I gladly went back and added it to the order. When I went back to give her the correct bill... She flipped out again, going crazy. I just asked if there was something on this bill that she didn't order. She and the girls, in shock, went over every single line of the bill, including the first few lines that showed their original three rounds, which said complimentary. They then took out their phones and went over everything line by line for the 100th time, adding everything up. Extremely rattled, Queen B. Karen simply said, One second, I need to use the washroom. Part of me thought that she might just pull a dine and dash and leave the baby Karens with the bill, but low-key, I did in a way, remind her that we had her ID and credit card without making it obvious that I thought she was going to run out on the bill. Ten minutes later, she comes back with new makeup, obviously she had been crying, and makes up a whole story about how the food was awful, the drinks were bad, and so on. She demanded that, as a bare minimum, I should cut the bill in half, with the agreement that the baby Karens would chip in even though she originally told them the night would be on her. Then, as if a light bulb went off in her head, she mentioned her relationship with the owner, as if it were to give me additional incentive to cut the bill in half. Holding back a grin at this point, I told her, No, just no, I can't change the bill. She whipped out her phone and showed me a series of texts with someone called my restaurant's name, owner, which I realized was what she was doing in the bathroom, probably changed one of the other Karen Minion's contact names, and deleted previous texts to start this new script. I read them, then clicked on the contact info and told her, that's not the owner's cell number. Her reply was, he has multiple phones for business and stuff. Of course, you don't know all his numbers. I remember thinking, wow, this girl thought of everything except I'm the actual owner. I told her, how about this? If we call him and he says it's okay to take 50% off the bill, then I'll do it. Her reply was yelling and screaming, and by this time, the few remaining customers all began to start looking, and I knew it was time to end this. I told her, already in a less accommodating voice, Cut the crap, little girl. You don't know the owner. You have never been here before, and if you keep yelling, I will call the police. Her demeanor changed, and she tried to defend herself the best she could. My reply to her weak comebacks was, My grandparents founded this restaurant. My family has been running this place for generations. I have worked here almost my entire life. I am the one and only owner of this restaurant, and I have never once seen you, heard of you, and I definitely never made a stranger I don't know and have never met before tonight any promises. The mini Karens were just frozen and didn't even know how to react. Queen B. Karen was in tears. I said, 
Now, I gave you the table you wanted, one of your specially reserved tables for high-end clients, which I didn't charge you for, and I gave you three rounds of free drinks. If you don't pay your bill, I will call the cops and hand them your ID. In tears, Queen Karen signed the bill, and the mini Karens took out their purses to give her whatever cash they had, which amounted to maybe a couple of hundred dollars with the promise to pay her back more. Two days later, a man walks into my restaurant fuming and asks one of my bartenders to speak to me. I was in the back office for a bit working, so he waited a good half hour for me. He was Queen Bee Karen's father. She was with him, keeping her head down. I took them both to my office and showed him highlights of the security cameras, which were especially good quality of audio because they were in the VIP area, and we had to keep good records of it due to other unrelated incidents before. So I showed him most of it. Their comments, their orders, everything. When all was said and done, he stormed out with her, screaming at her the whole time they were walking away. I haven't seen or heard from either of them since, but the original bill I gave them, the one that didn't count the $120 oysters, is framed on my desk. Side note, I didn't lose as much overhead on the table and three rounds as you might think. The table was originally supposed to be empty, so I didn't lose anything since I didn't expect to gain anything to begin with. The overhead for the food and other drinks more than covered the loss on the three free first rounds. I thought about posting this on Nuclear Revenge, but I read some of the stories there, and I think making this girl pay a few thousand and giving her a life lesson doesn't qualify. Some of the revenge there is life-ending revenge stories and losses in the tens or hundreds of thousands. The next one is a petty revenge story. I was a grocery checker in the 90s. One day around noon, I was working the 10 items or less, or cash-only express line that was used by many people who were just grabbing a quick sandwich for lunch. It was important to keep out people who had carts full of groceries. There was one other regular check stand open across from me that had one person being checked out with a large cart full. I didn't have anyone in my line at the time. Karen pulled up to the other check stand with a heaping cart and noticed me standing there. She asked if I could check her out. I told her, No, I'm sorry, I have to be available for people grabbing lunch. Over the next 30 seconds, she just stared at me and then pulled her cart up to my check stand and started putting all of her things on my check stand. She said, You're not doing anything. You can check me out. So I was kind of stuck. I tried to check her out as fast as I could and didn't say much. And wouldn't you know it, Pretty soon I had a line of about five people standing there with their sandwiches and Cokes glaring at me. Remember, it was a cash lane. So as I was finishing her order, Karen took out her checkbook and wrote a check. Mind you, she didn't start writing it until I was about done, causing more delay. This was her big mistake. Her address was on the check. So, on my lunch break, I got the subscription cards from all the magazines and proceeded to subscribe her to just about every magazine we carried and I always checked the two years bill me later option. I even signed her up for the Columbia Music Club, and I picked the very worst records. Weeks later, when she started getting all of the mags and bills for them, there was no way she would connect it to the checker she was rude to. I was probably one in a long string of cashiers she was rude to. Winner, me. The next one is a malicious compliance story. It has been a while, and I had a pro forma manager. Actually, we switched roles now and then, sometimes he was my manager, sometimes I was his, who backed me every time, and vice versa. We are still friends. Without going into details, a part of our job was reports. The marketing department used to come up with, we need this and that, and my job was to translate these requests into something useful and comprehensible for upper management. More often than not, those requests lacked an understanding of the overall market, but that's why I was involved. I often just translated them informing them of what I had done. In the market, sometimes the figures are not as good as expected. Who is to blame? The market? The planning? No, the reports are tinkered with. That's why they look so bad. One day, my, at that time, boss came up to me and said, Do not think, to which I replied with a dumbfounded, Huh? We had a good laugh, and he explained to me that they expected me from then on to write the reports exactly as requested, and the reports would only be reviewed by him a.k.a. he would just automatically forward me the request triggered by certain keywords. But every conversation we had ended with, and remember, do not think. I really hated that time, but I did exactly as I was told. It hurt to see the nonsense, the lack of coherent comparison. But I was not supposed to think. The figures looked better but were so ridiculous that, after a couple of months, our general manager came to us and asked what was going on after marketing couldn't explain the reports, again. 
not wanting to harm the company, I actually did double the work. One report for marketing and another correct one to be stored for later, and for my boss, as I was fully aware of the situation. We could explain. We even had comparisons ready and something for him to report to his regional manager. Of course, this had an impact. Suddenly, the position of head of marketing was vacant. One HR person who threatened us with repercussions left the company shortly after. I think three other people were demoted and left after a couple of months. And the GM greeted us with, You are free to think again for a week or two. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.